It says immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat, watch, was now in the middle of the sea. Look at this, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Look at your neighbor and tell them, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, look at this, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, oh, you have little faith. Why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Just for a few moments this morning, I, I do want to get this out. I want to speak to you on a message entitled, Living the Supernatural Life. Living the Supernatural Life. Before you're seated, look at your neighbor and tell me you look great this morning and you can be seated. You can be seated. at this crowd packed out Amen. packed out I want to talk to you about living the supernatural life and, and I want to remind many of us here that when we accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior how many know that he didn't just transfer us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of life I mean excuse me the kingdom of light but how many know he also transferred us from the laws of the natural to the laws of the supernatural. Amen. That's very important. We didn't just come out of the light into the dark, but we came out of the laws of the natural and now we're able to have dominion or power or we're able to function in supernatural things. See, often I, I think some of us, even in our church or in, in different churches around the world, we come to church, we're in the house, but we underestimate the reality that we no longer walk in the flesh. We no longer walk in the natural, but now we walk in the spirit-filled life. The spirit-filled life. We walk in the faith life. Say faith life. Faith life. Say it strong. Say faith life. faith life. We don't walk in the flesh. We don't walk in the natural. We walk in the spirit-filled life. We walk in the faith life. We walk in the supernatural life. The book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 16, you know what it says. The Bible says, walk in the spirit. Mm. Walk in the spirit that you shall, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That war, that battle, we don't walk in the natural. We walk in what? We walk in the spirit. And then I love this scripture in 1 John, chapter 2, verse 6. It says, he who abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So let me ask you, how many of you are abiding in Christ? Amen. Five of you. Amen. See, no, it, it's, it, I got it. It's going to be a different situation, But I'll tell you, how many of you are abiding in Christ? Amen. See, so if we're abiding in Christ, how many know we got to walk like Christ? Yes. We've got to walk in a spirit. What, what, how, what does it mean to walk like Jesus? Look at, watch. Jesus walked in power and authority over the natural world. So I'm to walk like Jesus. So I've got to walk. In the supernatural, I've got to live in the supernatural. I've got to walk in the power and authority over this natural world. See, I want you to know the spiritual life is not limited to the realm of the church house. In other words, we don't come to church to get supernatural. <laughs> you didn't get up this morning and shower and get dressed. I got to get I got to go to the place where I can get supernatural. This is not a supernatural car wash. And then as soon as you're done, you walk out and start walking in the flesh. How many know we're to live supernatural? Amen. I'll wait on you. 
We're not just supernatural on Sunday, brothers and sisters. We're supernatural on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday. Can you get with it? On Thursday, Friday, Saturday, back on Sunday. Are there any people here this morning that understand we're not called to walk in the flesh? We're called to live in the power of the supernatural. It's so necessary. And the reason it's so necessary is because often we fail to, to understand that we have the equipment to operate supernaturally. The supernatural is necessary because if you try to fix something in your life with natural weapons, but the battle you're facing is not natural, it's supernatural, you will fail. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that there's never, you're never going to find a natural solution for a supernatural problem. Is this good stuff? But how many know natural things apply to natural things, but when you're dealing with supernatural things as a believer, you have to activate the faith of the supernatural life to overcome those problems. Supernatural issues require a people who can walk in the supernatural, a people who know how to live and activate things in the supernatural. Tell your neighbor he's teaching good. There were two brothers, twins actually, this is a true story, who were in college and they came out of a country town and their parents were farmers and they were off far away from home in, in school pursuing their education and they had literally ran out of money. They had no money to eat. And they were real desperate and they didn't have any finances. So who do you call when you're in trouble? Call mom. They had one dime. And how many know, how many remember phone booth? <laughs> they went to the phone booth and they put in that dime and called mom. But when they got a hold of their mother, they began to share with her the problem they were having that they had no money to eat. And, and they said, Mom, we're really desperate. We really need finances. We really need help. But she began to share with them how they didn't have any money to give them, any money to send them. They'd spent all their money to send them to school. And now their father was sick, and everything they had was going to his health care. And they, they felt hopeless. And she says, listen, sons, I want you to know what I can offer you is prayer. And we could believe God for a breakthrough. So she began to pray for her sons and begin to pray a prayer of faith and said, Lord, if you're the only one that's able to provide in our situation. And after she said that prayer of faith and they came into agreement, the boys thanked her and they said, okay, we love you. And then the son, he hung up the pay phone. And as soon as he hung up the phone, 70 dimes came out of the pay phone. Who remembers? Some of you are not... So we had no interaction with a payphone, but how many remember when you, every now and then, come on, talk to me. Every now and then, you'd hang it up and a couple quarters, or, come on, somebody. Come on, talk to me. You remember, three quarters came out. He's like, ooh, come on, somebody. <laughs> Hung up the payphone, and 70 dimes came out. So these young men of integrity called the operator and says, Miss, we want you to know that we hung up the phone and 70 dimes came out. And she says, well, I don't know what to tell you. Just keep the money. So she took, they took those 70 dimes, and they went down to the market to buy some food. And they picked out the food they needed to eat, and, and they went to the counter to pay. And as they pulled out the 70 dimes, the manager took notice. And he saw that they were paying for their food with dimes. And he came over to them and says, listen, boys, why are you using dimes? And they begin to share their story, how they were hungry and they didn't have any food. They called their mom and they prayed and how when they hung up the phone, 70 dimes came out. And he says, you know, I want to tell you something. I need two men who could work in the back of my market. How many know we live in the supernatural life? How many know when you activate your faith, miracles are able to happen? Can I get anybody here this morning that says, I don't want to live in the natural? Can I get me on this section? Says, I don't want to live in the natural. I want to live in the supernatural now. See, Jesus taught his men, his disciples, how to activate faith and how to live in the supernatural. You see, you will find that quite often some Christians who are not moving forward, they're not moving forward 
And the reality is because they no longer are using their faith. They're no longer using their faith. They're no longer activating their faith. And, and the only place that you can learn faith is in the school of the supernatural. The only place that you can grow your faith is in the school of faith. Jesus took time to teach his disciples faith. And there's three things that Jesus did in teaching his disciples faith. Number one, he, he was present with them. He was with them. And what Jesus did is he actually demonstrated power in a place where his disciples could see it. He was with them. He did miracles in their midst. The miracles that Jesus performed, watch this, were performed and demonstrated to build the faith of his disciples. He wanted them to see it with their eyes. And he performed these miracles. That's why, as believers, I want you to know, every time we experience a miracle, how many of you have experienced a miracle? I mean, whether a big miracle or a small miracle, how many you give God praise right now for a miracle that happened for you? It could have been a little one, 70 dimes, or maybe it was a healing. Can you give God praise for that miracle? A healing, a miracle, a salvation? Watch, watch, watch. Every time we see a miracle or experience a miracle, it should grow our faith. Amen. We have no excuse to have shrinking faith. Our faith should be growing. Tell your neighbor your faith should be growing. He was present with them. Secondly, he prayed for them. Jesus prayed for his disciples, just like he continues to pray for us. There was one scripture in the Bible where, where he was speaking to his number one disciple, Peter. And he tells Peter, he goes, you know, Peter, he goes, uh, the enemy has asked for you. How I many? Well, that's pretty scary. He's asked to sift you like wheat. He says, but it's going to be OK, because you know why? I prayed for you. And I mean, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He makes intercession for us daily. He prayed for them. You know, he prayed for his disciples. He prayed to the Father that his disciples would do greater things than him. Isn't that heavy? That he actually prayed that his disciples would do greater miracles, greater things, right? That they would go on to expand his kingdom. And see the power of God. In other words, what I'm saying to each and every one of us is that we're not called not only to live in the natural and to live in the supernatural, but we are called to be the greater things generation. Amen. Let that get inside of you. We, 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 we are commanded to do greater things. We are supposed to do greater things. We are supposed to blow the minds of the world. We're supposed to move in power that the world has ever seen. You know, there's one example in the scripture that his disciples were moving in such strong anointing that the people said that they saw the spirit of Moses and Elijah on them. But that wasn't the spirit of Moses and Elijah. What that was, it was a greater things anointing that Jesus had poured into his disciples. And I think you ought to get excited about it to understand that this church and we as God's people, we're going to do greater things than we've ever seen before. We are going into a greater things season. Oh, I get excited about it. Because we're supposed to do greater things. Amen. And the third thing Jesus did is not only did he pray for his disciples, but thirdly, he pushed them. He pushed them. You say, oh, no, not my gentle Jesus. <laughs> Imagine standing on the edge of a cliff and you're admiring the scene. And you're like, oh, it's so good to be here. Let's build three tabernacles. And Jesus comes and kicks you in the back. And you <laughs> Not my gentle Jesus. Oh, yes, your gentle Jesus. You know, the way I learned how to swim, my, I was just like that on the edge of the pool. I was like, oh, you know, should I, should I not? I had my little ring. They didn't have cool vests back then. You know, they get these kids got these vests. Man, I would have like, where'd you get that ski vest, man? Back in the 70s, they give you a donut. <laughs> Who had the donut? And then when you jumped in, you had a hole so that you didn't go through the hole. Anyone remember that? Okay, maybe, maybe you had a tire. I don't know. <laughs> but I remember there, and then my dad comes, and he just grabs me, and he, what? I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And three, and he throws me into the deep end. And I'm like, ah, you know, drinking water and all that. 
That's how we learned how to swim, wasn't it? That's what Jesus did to his disciples. In fact, the Bible says right here that he told them, get in the boat and go on ahead of me. And he actually pushed them. Look at this. Pushed them into the deep. You see, Jesus is not reluctant to put us sometimes and allow us to go into situations and circumstances where we can practice what we've been being taught. He's not reluctant to allow us to go into challenges where we can practice what we are learning. How many feel like you're learning in church? How many feel like when you come, you're being taught, you're being trained, you're being imparted to? So Jesus is not reluctant to take us and to put us in a place. See, Jesus tells his disciples, go ahead of me. And as they launched out, that's when a storm began to arose. It was simply a test to your neighbor. It's just a test. But this is the place where Jesus wanted to see, this is key, if they would define the moment or if the moment would define them. Every time you're tested, you have to say, oh, this is good. Every time you're tested, you have to say, will I define the moment or will the moment define me? And I came to tell you, a greater works generation, you're bigger than the moment. You're bigger than the challenge. I wish you'd get more excited. You're bigger than the problem. You're bigger than the test. You're going to be bigger than the storm. He's not afraid to put us out there. See, this is the moment where Jesus took them from cognitive learning to experiential learning. What is cognitive learning? Cognitive learning is what you're getting right now, sitting in a classroom, sitting in, sitting in this Hellenistic style of teaching. You're in a chair, a person standing on the podium or behind a pulpit, and they're imparting into you. That's cognitive learning. That's the type of learning you get in school, in church. You get on Friday, for a Sunday night, family life flow. That's cognitive learning. But then he begins to take you and puts you in a place where you have experiential learning. And this is the time where everything you learn in the classroom, now you've got to put it to practice in your life. Can I hear an amen? Oh, he was teaching his disciples. He was imparting to his disciples. Then he tells them, get in the boat. I'll see you guys in a little bit. Come on, say amen. amen. And this is the moment where experience and learning took place through real life situations. There are, there are a few things here today that I want to give you before I send you home that we can learn to live the supernatural life. How many want to learn this stuff? The first thing we see in the story is in verse 28, we see that faith asks the right questions. Everybody say faith. Faith. Say it stronger. Say faith. Faith. Say it one more time like you want it to grow. Faith. Faith is asking the right questions. See, the disciples in the boat, in the storm, couldn't see Jesus, but they could hear him. And what I want you to know is that faith is not responding to what you see, but it's responding to what you hear. The Bible says faith comes by seeing. No. Am I telling the truth? The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The disciples were in the boat. They could not see him. But Peter cried out, right? And if Jesus had never said come, he would have never stepped out of the boat. But here's what I want you to know is that Jesus is constantly speaking. The question is, are you listening? <laughs> I was talking to the other day, and they're you know, talking, talking, and I said, you don't need to stop talking. Learn to listen. Because faith doesn't come through talking. He said, but that's how I listen. No, 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 shut your mouth. Faith doesn't come through talking. Faith comes through closing your mouth and opening up your ears and understand that God is always talking to you. When you open up the Bible in the morning, he's talking to you. When you watch a sermon on YouTube, he's talking to you. When you come into church on Sunday morning, he's talking to you. When you're in your Bible study, he's talking to you. Man, you got to learn how to pray. Get before God. Shut your mouth. Open up your ears and say, Lord, speak to me. You 
say, what's he saying? I want to take you higher. I want to take you to a new level. I want to bring you out of the storm. I want to take you into greater things. They asked the right question. The second thing is this, is that faith releases the supernatural. We see that in verse 29, is that Peter, look at this, not only asked the right question and heard the voice of God, but Peter was willing to act upon what he heard. He was willing to act. It wasn't until Peter got up, stepped out of the boat, that that's when the supernatural was released. In other words, if you want to see the power of God and move in the supernatural, you got to make a move. <laughs> you you, you got to make a move. You, you, you got you to gotta do something. The, the, the touching point for miracles is not just faith, it's action. And the minute you begin to step out on what God is speaking to you, now in the spirit realm, miracles can be released. See, it's not until you move that something happens in the kingdom. Notice this, that the other disciples did nothing. Okay? The other disciples did nothing, risked nothing, therefore received nothing. Oh. If that's all you get today, come on and give God a praise. That, if that's all you get out of this, brother. They did nothing, they risked nothing, and they got nothing. But when Peter got out of the boat, the Bible says he began to move in a different spiritual dimension. The people who were in the boat were living in the natural. When Peter got out of the boat, he went from living in the natural to living and walking in the supernatural. What am I trying to tell you, Victor Alex San Diego? We're not called to spend the rest of our life in the boat. He's calling us to walk on water. He's calling us to do growth. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. I'm not going to stay in no boat the rest of my life. I refuse to believe that Jesus went to Calvary, suffered, died, and was buried and rose on the third day so I can stay stuck in a boat the rest of my life. I'm a part of that greater things generation. I'm walking on water, and I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that you want to walk on water with your pastor. You want to go to the places that God is. Hey! Touch your neighbor, tell him, get out of the boat. Touch that other person, tell them, get out of the flesh. Touch that other person, tell them, get out of the depression. Get out of the fear. Get out of the problem. Get out of the boat and let God begin to do something great in your life. Tell your neighbor, I ain't staying in no boat. I'm a water walker. You know what, we want a person of faith this. Watch this. A, a person of faith walks on what other people sink in. You know what a, you know what a, a person of faith, you know, what a, you know what a person of faith is? Watch this. A person of faith doesn't just separate themselves from unbelievers. A person of faith separates themselves from other disciples. Read the Bible. They were all disciples, but only one separated. Oh. They were all called. They were all chosen. They all got died for. They all received the blood of Jesus. They're all going to heaven. But only one of them said, I'm not going to be satisfied. I'm getting out of the boat because God has a big plan. God has a big dream. I don't know. I don't know where you're at, but I came to tell you, I'm walking on water. I'm ready to go to another level. Who's going to walk with me? Who's going to walk with Georgina? Who's going to walk with the leaders? Who's ready? I said, who's ready? I said, who's ready to get out of the
themselves. Our church isn't like every other church. You say, ah, I'm new. This church is crazy. Ah, it's cool. We were crazy for Jesus, amen? We were crazy for the devil. We were crazy for the neighborhood. We were crazy for drugs. But Jesus came in and he taught us how to walk on water, how to walk on wind, how to soar like an eagle. Our God is champion. He's undefeated. He reigns forever. I'm hooping. I'm preaching. Somebody shout to the Lord. If you're a water walker, get out of your seat. Get up here. I'm a water walker. Watch me get out the boat. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. to control your destiny. I don't know where your particular fear comes from, but we all deal with it. Some of it comes from our childhood, disappointments, 
past failures. We all deal with it. Someone the other day said to me, Pastor, you know, I've been watching you and been through a lot of things and just, man, it just seems like nothing shakes you. You know, you're just always smiling and trying to, hey, everybody, be there and be in your post and working hard. And do you ever have fear? And I said to them, of course I have fear. I have a lot of fear in my life. That fear that tries to come and attack me. And I've been dealing with it a lot lately because it seems like ever since we said we're going to expand this building, boom, it came. And then anytime, you know, went to Chilvis, okay, Ohio. What do you fear? I fear nothing. I fear myself. Can I do it? Can I perform for God? You know, those insecurities. I think anything, anything that God calls you to do is going to scare you a little bit. If it doesn't scare you, it's not God. It's not God. That's one fear. I also fear for our leaders sometimes. I say, you know, I've been walking with us a long time. Been through tough seasons with us and been there. But I fear, I say, Lord, I hope my fear is that they'll lose the fire, lose the passion for you, lose that belief in the dream of what God wants to do in this house. I'll tell you, I believe this, you know, that if we stay focused, we're going to see every promise God given us come to pass. I believe it. Our children are going to serve the Lord. Our grandchildren to the third and the fourth generation. Come on, somebody. That's the vision of this church. future and how many know all oh, that kids are going to be blessed paid off building 1200 seater good god oh my god whoever that kid is amen we're paying the bill for that but that's okay i mean well, that's okay i mean we should go to the next generation it should go to those kids microphone on in the cockpit and the plane started having some serious engine trouble and you overheard the captain freaking out and yelling at the co-pilot we're going down what would you do I know what you do. You be looking for parachutes. Where are the parachutes? <laughs> we can't afford to show fear. Because faith is not just about us. Faith is about our passengers. Caught that. It's about our passengers. twisted their mind the Jesus that did all the miracles before their eyes they saw the lame leap they saw the leper cleanse they saw the blind see they seen it all of a sudden they're in that storm and the very same Jesus coming to them walking on water in the supernatural life and what do they say What'd they say? It's a ghost. It's a ghost. Don't tell me fear won't twist you. Is this good teaching? Don't tell me fear won't twist you. Jesus says, if it's you, do what you've always done. On the day I met you,
I met you that day, Jesus. You said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That was what you said to me. And Lord, here I am in this storm and here I am knowing you want to take me to another level. Say it to me again, Father. Bid me to come. He says, come. But this time, come to me in the supernatural. Come on, somebody. Come to me in the supernatural. Come to me. Because the first time you came to me, you came to me in the flesh. You came to me broken. You came to me bound. You came to me sick. You came to me smelling like hell. And I received you. But this time I want you to come to me in the supernatural. Because I've already done a powerful work in your life. And you're going to another. Who got a hold of that word? Who can say yes, Lord? I'm coming in the supernatural. 